Good morning. In today's lesson, we are going to talk about probability. And the three main questions that we are going to answer in this lesson are the following. Number one, what is probability and why do we need to study it? Number two, what are the different probability rules? And number three, how do we apply those rules to solve real life problems? Before we discuss the rules of probability, let us trace first how probability evolved from a mathematics that only interests gamblers to the present day when it is considered as one of the pillars of artificial intelligence, quantum mechanics, and business, and practically any field that tried to quantify uncertainty. The scientific study of probability is a modern development in mathematics. Gambling shows that there has been an interest in quantifying the ideas of probability. The 16th century Italian polymath Hirolamo Cardano demonstrated the efficacy of defining odds as the ratio of favorable to unfavorable outcomes, which implies that the probability of an event is given by the ratio of favorable outcomes to the total number of possible outcomes, which we now call as the sample space. In 1654, the doctrine of probabilities dates back to the correspondence of Pierre de Fermat and Blaise Pascal. In 1657, Christian Huygens gave the earliest non-scientific treatment of the subject, and then Jacob Bernoulli's Ars Conjectandi, published posthumously in 1713, and Abraham de Moivre's Doctrine of Chances in 1718, treated the subject as a branch of mathematics. Our source is Ian Hacking's The Emergence of Probability and James Franklin's The Science of Conjecture. The theory of errors may be traced back to Roger Coates' Opera Miscellanea, also published posthumously in 1722. The first two laws of error originated from Pierre Simon Laplace. These laws of errors are very important because one of them gave way to what we call now as the normal distribution or the Gauss law. The first law was published in 1774 and stated that the frequency of an error could be expressed as exponential function of numerical magnitude of the error, disregarding the sign. While the second law of error was proposed in 1778 by Laplace and stated that the frequency of the error is an exponential function of the square of the error. And this second law of error is now called the normal distribution or the Gauss law. In 1805, Adrian Marie Legendre developed the method of least squares. Then a lot more mathematicians contributed to the body of probability knowledge that we now have. In 1906, Andrei Markov introduced the notion of Markov chains which played an important role in stochastic processes theory in its applications. You will hear a lot about stochastic gradient descent when you study machine learning, neural network, and the mathematics of artificial intelligence. So now that we talk a lot about self-driving cars, all these applications that we have now can be traced back to the development of mathematics just in the past 400 to 500 years. In order to understand this lesson, let's begin with some simulation. What you can see on your screen is an interactive spinner from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics website. Our spinner has two parts, one is colored blue and the other is colored yellow. And you can see here the tally. When we perform the experiment, the numbers will be written here in terms of percentage. And also what you can see here is the theoretical probability. Now, since this spinner has two parts, one for the blue and one for the yellow, the theoretical probability of getting a blue is one out of two or one half, or in percentage, it's 50%. Similarly, the probability of getting a yellow is also 50%. Now let's spin this spinner once and let's see the result. So we get one yellow and zero blue. Let's do it one more time. Now we got 50, 50, one for the blue and one for the yellow. Let's spin it eight more times to get a total of 10 spins. After 10 spins, notice what happened. We got seven blue and three yellow. Something must be wrong. Our theoretical probability is 50%, but we are getting 70% for blue and 30% for the yellow. Is somebody cheating here? Let's spin this 90 more times to get 100 spins all in all. Notice that after 100 spins, we got 51% for blue and 49% for yellow. Let's spin this 900 more times to get a total of 1,000 spins. 
and we get 49.6 versus 50.4 percent which is even closer to the theoretical probability of 50 percent so what's happening here is what we call as the law of large numbers the law of large numbers states that as the number of identically distributed randomly generated variables increases their sample mean or average approaches their theoretical probability. To visualize what's happening in our experiment, let's move to another website. This is from the statistical applets probability from the website digitalfirst.bfwpub.com. What we're going to do here is we are going to toss a coin, a fair coin, with a 50% probability of getting heads and 50% probability of getting tails. Let's toss the coin once. We get one heads and zero tails. By the way, when we are talking about about the results of tossing a coin we call it one heads normally we say one head but in the context of tossing a coin we call the results as heads and tails so let's toss the coin one more time we now have two heads and zero tails let's toss the coin eight more times so we can get ten tosses all in all let's toss the coin several more times and I want you to see what's going on with this line so we start with one for the heads and zero for the tail and then it went down to 30% and then it's going up again. Let's continue tossing the coin. It goes up and down, goes up and down and goes up and down. So let's continue doing that. Now, after 25 tosses, we got this result, 42.4% for the heads and 576 for the tails. Let's toss it 25 more times and let's continue tossing and toss and toss. Now, notice that after tossing the coin more than 700 times, you can now see a pattern. No matter how I toss the coin, the result is always close to this imaginary line. If I'm going to trace that line with another color, let's say a color green line, and let's zoom that out. Notice now that the probability is just going up and down, up and down a little bit, and then down again and down again and up again with respect to this green line. And what is that green line? That green line is the 50%, which is our expected theoretical probability when we toss a fair coin. 50% of the time, the result is heads. 50% of the time, the result is tails. And that is now demonstrated by this green line. But our experimental probability at the start fluctuates so much away from that theoretical probability. But as we repeat the experiment over and over, large number of times, we notice that the result becomes closer and closer to the 50% mark. This phenomenon that we observe is what we call as the law of large numbers. This green line is what we call theoretical probability, whereas the blue line is what we call as the experimental or empirical probability. When we talk about probability, we talk about the likelihood of something happening. For example, we ask the question, what is the chance that I will win in the lottery? Or we can ask the question, what is the chance that I will live longer than 70 years? These kind of questions entail the use of probability. In terms of datation, we use the capital letter P followed by a parenthesis and inside the parenthesis is the description of the event. For example, we read this one as the probability of winning the lottery. Or in general, we just call it as the probability of an event A where A represents the event we wish to find the probability of. And we use relative frequency in order to compute for the probability. So the probability of A is equal to the number of favorable outcomes divided by by the total possible outcomes or what we call as the sample space. For example, when we toss a fair coin once, the probability of getting ahead is one out of two. In many statistics books, you can see this notation, which is equivalent to this definition. The probability of an event E is equal to N of E, or the number of times the event E happened over the sample space, or the total number of times that event can happen. In some textbooks, there are three types of probabilities, and these are the following. One is what we call as the classical or the theoretical probability. An example of classical or theoretical probability is like 
like this. If I have this die, the theoretical probability of getting a 1 is 1 out of 6 because there is only one 1 and there are 6 possible outcomes. But in the observational or empirical probability or also called as the frequent test because they always want to come up with a frequency distribution, we are going to perform experiment. We toss and we got 2 in the first toss and we can come up with a tally. Since we get a 5, repeat the experiment. We got a 2 and we get a 3 and 2 again and so on. So notice that if we perform only very few trials or repetitions, the distribution of the observational or empirical or the frequency is very much different than the theoretical because we are expecting here to be 1 over 6 since there are 6 faces in this die the probability of getting a 1 is 1 out of 6 the probability of getting 2 is 1 out of 6 and so on you need to perform this experiment so many times so that the result of your frequency distribution here would be almost similar to what is expected theoretically or the theoretical probability. And we now say that in the observational or empirical probability, the probability of an event A is the ratio of M over N as the number of trials approaches infinity, which is similar to saying, repeat this experiment so many times and you will notice that this ratio would approach the theoretical probability. And this kind of probability gives credibility to standard estimates based on sampling, which means that if we pick a large enough samples, then whatever is the measurement of that sample would be closer to the theoretical or the true measurement of the population. But we'll talk about the concept of sampling later on. Now the third type of probability that is important in the application in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, is the combination of all these other two plus the injection of some subjective criteria. And another term for this type of probability is the Bayesian, named after the English mathematician and clergy, Thomas Bayes. For example, as an intelligent robot like IBM Watson gained more experience from playing Jeopardy million of times over and over, its learning is recorded as adjustments in weight multiplier for its variables. Those weight adjustments can be thought of as subjective expert opinions in the form of learning from prior experience. 538.com ran three models to forecast election. One is using objective fundamentals, the second is using expert opinions, and the third is a combination of the first two. They found out that among the three modeling approaches, the one that combines the fundamentals with the expert opinion was more accurate in predicting election results. Now, let's talk about seven probability rules. The first rule of probability is this one. For any event A, the probability of A is between 0 and 1. What does it mean? Let's go back to this example. What is the probability of getting a 1? Since there is only one side with a 1, then we say that the probability of landing on a 1 is 1 out of 6. What is the probability of getting a number greater than or equal to 4? Since the possible results are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, then the probability of getting a value of greater than or equal to 4 are this one, this one, this one. And we get 3 over 6. Now, what is the probability of getting a 0? Since there is no 0, then we say the probability of getting a 0 here is 0. What is the probability of getting 7? Since there is no 7 here, the probability is also 0. What is the probability of getting greater than or equal to 1? Since all of these are greater than or equal to 1, the probability of getting this is 6 out of 6 or 1. So if you look at the range now of the results, we get a probability from 0 as the lower limit and 1 as the upper limit. The probability of any event is ranging from 0 to 1, where 0 is an impossible event and 1 as a sure event. That is the meaning of probability rule number 1. But the function of this rule number 1 is we can determine later on whether the probability is correct or not. Anytime you get a probability that is more than 1 or equivalently more than 100% is incorrect and any probability that's negative is also incorrect. 
the range of values for probability is only between 0 and 1. But when you convert that to percentage, you multiply by 100 to get the percent. That becomes 0 to 100%. Now, probability rule number 2. The sum of probabilities of all possible outcome is 1. And we already have seen that. In tossing a coin, the probability of getting heads is 1 half. The probability of getting tails is also 1 half. And the total, 1 half plus 1 half, is 1. 2 over 2, or 1. In the event of tossing a die, the probabilities are the following. Probability of getting a 1 is 1 6. Probability of getting a 2 is 1 6, and so on. And the total of this is 6 over 6, or 1. The sum of probabilities of all possible outcome is 1 or 100%. That's probability rule number 2. Probability number 3 is very important when you are solving problems that involve at least or greater than or equal to. This is the rule. We call this as the complement rule. The probability of not A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. And we can write this in notation like this. The probability of A prime, where A prime is the complement of A, is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. Let's have an example. Two-sided number cubes are rolled. Find the probability that the sum of the numbers rolled is greater than 2. When you are solving probability questions, the first question that you need to ask yourself is, what is the sample space? If you roll these two cubes, how many possible results are there? In order for us to exhaust all those possible results, we can think of that this way. These top numbers represent the result of this cube. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, representing each of these results. And you can think of this yellow cube results to be this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you roll this cube, there are these results. You can get a 1 and a 1, and the sum is 2. So you can get a 2 and a 1, and you get a sum of 3. You get a 3 and a 1, and the sum is 4. And you can see pattern. And you understand how these numbers are generated. If you get 6 and 6, the sum is 12. Now the problem says, find the probability that the sum of the numbers rolled is greater than 2. So where are the numbers that are greater than 2? So 2 is not part of that. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, they are all greater than 2. And this row are all greater than 2 until the last row. So basically, all the numbers except these two satisfy the condition of getting a sum that is greater than 2. So we therefore count all these results. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. If we define A as the event of getting a sum greater than 2, then the probability of A is 35 over 36. Where do we get the 35? It's the one that we just counted out of the 36 possible outcomes. If A is the event of getting a sum greater than 2, the complement of A is getting a sum that is, of course, less than or equal to 2. As we have seen in this grid, there is only one number that's less than or equal to 2. So this is A, and the complement of A is A prime. Using now the complement rule, the probability of A can also be computed if we know A prime. Or conversely, if you are solving for the probability of the event A, the probability of event A could also be 1 minus the probability of its complement. From that observation, there is a better way to solve this problem. When I count 35 out of 36, I purposely count each one of the elements to show that you are prone to committing an error if you are going to count all those 35 items. A better way of solving this problem is why not get the probability of the complement and there is only one out of the 36 possible results satisfying this, so 1 over 36. And once we know that the complement is 1 over 36, subtract it from 1 to get the probability of A. So we therefore have now probability of A equals 1 minus the probability of the complement 1 over 36 equals 35 over 36, which is just the same as the result when we do all those counting. So in cases like this, and in so many cases later on, especially when we are solving probabilities that involve the word at least, then you will find this complement rule to be very, very important. Now, before we move to probability rule number four, 
let's define what are disjoint events. Two events that cannot occur, cannot, at the same time are called disjoint events. Or another term is mutually exclusive events. Visually, they look like this. If you have this event A and event B, they are considered disjoint if they do not overlap. For example, male and female, add or even, they are considered as disjoint events. An example of a not disjoint event would be like this. Set A contains the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and set B contains the elements 3, 4, 5, 6. If you are going to graph the two, 1, 2 would be outside, 3 and 4 are common, and 5 and 6 are in the other circle. So, 3 and 4 are the overlaps of these two sets. And therefore, we now say that this is an example of a not disjoint or not mutually exclusive sets. So this is an example of a not disjoint or not mutually exclusive events. This is very important because for rule number four and number five, you have to identify whether the events are disjoints or not disjoints. So here is now probability rule number four, the addition rule for disjoint events. If A and B are disjoint events, meaning to say they do not overlap, then the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus B. And please take note that the word or, this word or, is oftentimes associated with the addition symbol in this probability. When you encounter the word or, you are going to use the plus sign. So how do we apply now this rule number four? Let us suppose that we are going to roll a die once. What is the probability that you get a two or a three? Now the word or here is a signal that you are going to add. So this means you can get the probability of a two plus the probability of getting a three. And what is the probability of getting a two here? There is only one two out of six, so it's one over six. And the probability of getting a three is also 1 over 6. And therefore, the probability of getting a 2 or a 3 is equal to 2 over 6 or, in simplest form, 1 over 3. Or in percentage, 33.3%. So that is the addition rule of probability. Next, what is the probability of getting an odd or an even number? So how many odd numbers are here? There are three. So the probability of getting an odd plus the probability of getting an even number. And the probability of getting an odd is 3 out of 6. And the probability of getting an even number is 3 out of 6. So we get 6 over 6 or 1. So that means when you toss this die, no matter what you do, you are sure to get an odd or an even because it's either an odd or an even. That is the addition rule. How about this question? For the next uh, question, let us list down the sample space here. The sample space is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When you roll a die, these are the only possible results. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, what is the probability of getting a 2? Or, or, an even number. So what are the even numbers there? You have 2, you have 4, you have 6. So there is now an overlap. When there is an overlap, you will commit an error of double counting these twos. When there is an overlap, what we are going to do is apply this general addition rule where it says the probability of A or B when A and B overlap, meaning they are not disjoint, is equal to the sum of the probabilities of A and the probability of B minus the intersection, minus the intersection. And in this particular example, you can think of that this way. You have two, four, six as the bigger set, and there's another set that is the two, and the two is counted twice. So when you apply now this general addition rule, we now have the probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A 
and B. And the probability of A is 1 out of 6. There's only 1, 2 out of 6. So probability of A is 1 over 6 plus probability of B, there are 1, 2, 3 out of 6, 3 over 6. And we subtract the number of times they overlapped. And this is the overlap. There is one overlap, so minus 1 over 6. To get 1 plus 3 equals 4, minus 1 equals 3 over 6, which is 1 half. The interpretation of this rule number 5 is that when there is an overlap, you will be double counting the elements inside this overlap. And in order to avoid that double counting, we are going to subtract that intersection so we do not overcount. That is why it's very, very important that you identify whether the event is disjoint or not disjoint before applying the addition rule. When the events are disjoint, apply probability rule number four. Just add the probabilities of A and B. But when the events are not disjoint, meaning to say there's an overlap, you need to subtract the overlap. And this is called as the general addition rule because this rule applies to all cases. And probability rule number four is just a special case because in probability rule number four, this overlap is zero. Be careful whenever you apply the addition rule, always ask yourself, are the events disjoint or not disjoint? And the answer to that question determines whether you are going to apply probability rule number four or probability rule number five. Let's have an application of the addition rule in this problem. In a standard deck of cards, what is the probability of a two or a face card? So we have here the twos, and there are four of them. And we have here the face cards, six for each color, six red and six black. We notice that there is no overlap between the twos and the face cards. So they are mutually exclusive. They are disjoint. And therefore, since they are disjoint, what we are going to do is we will just add their corresponding probabilities. So we'll just add the probability of getting A2 plus, plus the probability of getting A face card. And what is the probability of getting A2? There are four twos out of the entire deck of cards, which has 52 cards and for the face cards we have all these 6 12 12 face cards out of 52 12 out of 52 and therefore the probability of getting a 2 or a face card is 4 plus 12 16 over 52 which you can just reduce the lowest term as 4 over 13 let's go to another problem what is the probability of getting a red or an ace? So let's gather all the red cards, and there are 26 of them. And let's gather all the aces, and let's locate all the aces. Let's go to the next example. What is the probability of getting a red or an ace? So let's gather all the red cards, there are 26 of them. And let's locate all the aces, and there are 4 aces. From here, you will notice that there is an overlap, and those are the ace of diamond and ace of heart. So in the events that there are overlaps, we are going to apply the general addition rule. So here is the general addition rule. When there is an overlap, the probability of A or B is equal to the individual probabilities minus the probability of the overlap. So let's do that. So for the probability of red, so we have probability of a red plus the probability of getting an ace minus the probability of getting a red or an ace. So what's the probability of getting red? There are 26 reds. So 26 out of the sample space 52. What is the probability of getting an ace? There are four aces. So four out of 52 minus the overlap. How many overlaps do we have? There are two aces that are also red cards, so we have 2 out of 52. And so, 26 plus 4 is 30, minus 2 is 28 out of 52. And reduce that to lowest term, we got 
7 out of 13. So these two examples illustrate the use of the addition rule. When there is no overlap, just add the probabilities. When there is an overlap, add the probabilities of each event minus the overlap. At this point, we are now ready to answer many word problems. Let's have this problem. A bag contains 20 balls, three of those are red, six are colored green, four are colored blue, two are colored white, and five are colored yellow. One ball is selected at random. Find the following probabilities. What is the probability of getting a red or a green? So let's visualize the situation. The bag contains these 20 balls, three red, six green, four blue, two white, and five yellow. One ball is selected at random. Find the probability of getting a red or a green. Since there's no overlap between red and green, we are going to simply add the probability of red, and what's the probability of getting a red? It's one, two, three. So it's three out of the 20 balls. Four is translated to addition. Green, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six green out of the 20 balls in the sample space. So we have nine out of 20. So the probability of getting a red or a green is nine out of 20. Next, what is the probability that we get a red, a white, or a blue? This one is just an extension of the addition rule. This time we have three events. And all these events are mutually exclusive. They do not overlap. A red ball cannot be white, a white ball cannot be blue, and a blue cannot be red. So, we simply have to add one-third, which has a probability of 3 over 20. This is or, so we add. White has a probability of 2 out of 20, and the blue has a probability of 4 out of 20, and we added 3 plus 2, 5 plus 4 is 9 out of 20. And then number 3, what is the probability of getting not blue? Now, as we have said in the complement rule, sometimes it is easier to just count the number of blue than counting those that are not blue, because there are lesser blues than non-blues here. So what we can do here is apply the complement rule. The probability of not blue is equal to 1 minus its complement, the probability of blue. And so we get 1 minus, what's the probability of blue? It's 4 out of 20, which is equal to 16 out of 20, which we can reduce the lowest term as 4 over 5. So here's another example that applies the addition rule of probability. Think of this as an electric circuit, and A and B are components of that circuit. You will notice that if one of these is defective, the electricity can still go through. So if A is not working, the electric current can go through here. If B is not working, it can go the other way. When one of these components is working, then the circuit is still working. So let's define A as the event component A is operating, and B is the event that component B is operating, and the probability of the event A is 99%. 99% of the time, component A is working. Then the probability of B is 0.98. Now, the probability that both A and B are working is 0.97202. The question is, find the probability that the circuit is functioning. So in order to solve this, notice that as long as one of them is working, the circuit is functioning. So this can be interpreted as an OR. They have two components in order to safeguard that the circuit is working in the event that one is not working. As long as one of the components is working, the circuit is working. This is an OR problem. In order to solve this, we use the addition rule because of the word OR. So we have to add probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A and B. So we got 0 0.99 plus 0 0.98 
minus 0 0.97202. And let's get our calculator to answer this. So we got 0 0.99798. When converted to percentage, that is 99.798. So in this system, 99.798% of the time, the circuit is working. That is one way how our engineers are safeguarding their circuits, using some backup. A alone can work at 99%, B alone can work at 98% probability, but by using both of them, you increase the chance of the circuit working to 99.798%. You are going to spend some more resources just to get that additional confidence. Now, in order for us to understand the next two rules, let's define what are independent events. Two events are independent if the fact that one event has occurred does not affect the probability that the other event will occur. For example, if I have these two coins, if I toss this coin and I get heads, tossing the second coin will not be affected by the result of the first one. Still, I will get a head or a tail here. In that way, we now say that these two events are independent. Also, when I toss these two dice, the result of one does not affect the result of the other. So these are examples of independent events. Now, what are examples of dependent events? Now, let me demonstrate an example of a not independent or dependent event. So, it's the opposite of independent. If I have these 14 balls inside this box, if I'm going to draw two balls without replacement, I pick one. What is the probability of getting this first ball? It's one out of the total number of balls, which is 14. But the second time I draw a ball, the result here is now affected by the first one because the probability of getting this second one is no longer 1 over 14, but 1 over 13. Because one ball was already taken out, then the total number of balls here left is only 13. So drawing the second ball is affected by drawing the first ball. Let me write it. If I have a box containing 14 balls, so the box has 14 balls all in all. If I draw the first ball from the box and there are 14 balls all in all, the probability of the first draw is 1 out of 14 because there's only one ball I took out out of the 14 and then I keep it. Now, the next time I draw another ball, the probability of this one is no longer 1 over 14. Because I already removed one, I am just selecting one ball out of 13 balls, so the probability of the second event is 1 out of 13. This is a case of a dependent. The second event is affected by the first event because when you took out one ball, the total number of balls available is already subtracted by one. So the second event depends on the fact that the first event happened. That is now what you mean by dependent independent events. Two events are independent if the fact that one event has occurred does not affect the probability that the other event will occur. Probability rule number six. If A and B are independent events, meaning to say the first event does not affect the second event, then the probability of A and B, so the word now here is and, is equal to the product of their probabilities. Please take note that the word and here is translated to multiplication. So let's have an example. So in the next example, let us toss a die and a coin. So let's toss it. These are the possible results. It could be heads or tails. It could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Question. What is the probability of getting heads and 2? So you get heads and 2. So it will happen here. So therefore, the probability of getting H and 2 would be equal to this one happening, 1, out of 
the sample space which is 12. Now you will notice that this 1 over 12 can be computed even without this chart. What you are going to do is apply probability rule number 6. So in probability rule number 6, our P of H is, there's only one head, out of 2 is 1 half. Our P of 2 is 1 out of 6 possible outcomes. So 1 over 6. And using the multiplication rule, the probability of H and 2 would be the product of these two. So that would become 1 half times 1 over 6. And 1 half times 1 6 is 1 over 12, which is just the same as this 1 over 12 that we observe if we created this chart. In other words, in cases when you cannot visually list down all the possibilities, you know that you still get the same result by just multiplying the probability of the first event times the probability of the second event if they are independent. Now, next question. What is the probability of getting tails, so tail is here, and greater than 3? So tail and greater than or equal to 3. So this one, two, three, four. So our answer is 4 out of 12. But applying probability rule number 6, we are going to get the product. The probability of t would be 1 out of 2. So we have 1 half multiplied because of the word and. Probability of getting 3 or more is 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 out of 6 because there are 6 faces in this die and greater than or equal to 3 is 4 out of 6 faces so 4 over 6 if you multiply them you now get 1 times 4 is 4 2 times 6 is 12 which is similar to the first result we just have to write this in lowest term as 1 over 3 we got the same result by applying the multiplication rule and by actually listing all those possible results. But as I have said, in application, when you are dealing with millions of data sets, you need to rely on this rule because there is no way you can list down one million observations. Here is another example. At the entrance to a casino, there are two slot machines. Machine A is programmed that in the long run, it will produce a winner in 10% of plays. Think of this as machine A. So the probability of winning in machine A is 10%. It will produce a winner in 10% of plays. Then there is another machine, machine B. And machine B is programmed so that in the long run, it will produce a winner in 15% of plays. If somebody play both machines, what is the probability that that person win on both plays? So since it says win on both, this is an end problem. And an end problem in probability is translated as multiplication rule. So what's the probability of getting a win on both plays? So we simply multiply probability of A times probability of B. And probability of A is 0.10. Probability of B is 0.15. And 0.10 times 0.15 is equal to 0 0.015. Translated to percentage, this is 1.5%. So those who want to go to the casino and play slot machine, think about this chance. Only 1.5% that you will win on those two machines. Now, let's take a look. What's the probability that you will lose on both machines? So probability that you lose on both plays. So how do we compute for that? If you win 10% of the time, the complement is you will lose. The probability of losing A is its complement, which is equal to 1 minus 0 0.01, 1 minus 10% or 90%. And the complement of the event B is equal to 1 minus this 15% or 0 0.15 
which is equal to 85% or 0.85. The probability that you will lose on both machine is the product of the complement of A times the probability of the complement of B, which is 0 0.9 times 0 0.85. And let's use our calculator. So we get 0 0.9 times 0.85 equals 0 0.765 converted to percentage 76.5% of the time you will lose on both machines. You have a chance of winning 1.5% and you have a chance of losing 76.5%. Will you still play the casino slot machine? You know the answer. And then the third question is, what is the probability that you win in at least one play? So this is now what I mean by using the complement rule to answer the question that involved the word at least. To answer this kind of problem, we have to interpret it this way. Winning in at least one means you either win in the first or you win both ways. You either win in machine A or you win in machine B or you win in both machines. But that involves several computations. A better approach to solving this is the fact that winning at least one is the complement of not winning. If you win in at least one, its complement is not winning at all. So let me repeat. The complement of winning in at least one play, just one winning, the complement of that is not winning at all. So if you lose in everything, you do not win at least once. And knowing that this is the complement, then it would be easier for us to solve this problem because we already know the probability of not winning at all. We know that you will lose on both machines 76.5% of the time. So therefore, in order to answer number three, it's just a matter of subtracting one minus the complement which has a probability of 0 0.765 and that gives us 23.5% of the time. So using the complement rule, we can easily solve the problem that involves the word at least because we will just get the complement and most of the time it is easier to find the probability of the complement than finding the probability of the event itself. Because in this case, you have to count all these probabilities, whereas in the complement, you just have to subtract the result from one. So the probability, so the probability that you win in at least one play is 23.5%. Let's have this other problem. 40% of bottled water samples are merely tap water. While 30% of bottled water samples are contaminated by pollutants such as arsenic and some bacteria. If two samples are independently selected, what is the probability that both samples are contaminated by pollutants? Now notice here the word independently selected. Since they are independently selected, then they fall under the category independent events. And therefore we can apply rule number six. So there are two samples that are independently selected. You have the first sample and the second sample. They are independently selected, so we are going to multiply. What is the probability that both samples are contaminated? So that means the first sample is contaminated, the second sample is also contaminated. But it says 30% of the time, the samples are contaminated. So this is 0.30. And then the second sample is also contaminated, so another 0.30. And you multiply 0.30 times 0.30 equals 0. 0.9, which is 9%. So 9% of the time, in this scenario, you will get a contaminated bottled water. So that's another application of the multiplication law of probability. Now, let's take a look at the multiplication rule for dependent events. So the probability of A and B, when A and B are dependent events, is equal to the probability of the first event times the probability of B given A. So you will notice that there is a new notation here. This is read as the probability of event B given that event occurred. In other words, A happened already, the first event happened already, 
and then we compute the probability of the second event after the first event happened. Let me illustrate that this way. An IRS auditor, the Internal Revenue Service, has a list of 12 taxpayers whose tax returns are questionable. The inspector will choose two of these people to be audited. Eight of the taxpayers are from Maryland and four are from Virginia. What is the probability that both people selected are from Maryland? So let's dissect this problem. There are 12 taxpayers. Imagine that you have a box containing 12 names. There are 12 names. Of those 12 names, eight are from Maryland and four are from Virginia. And you are going to choose two of these 12. You're going to choose two. So the first and the second. When you pick the first person, what is the chance that the person selected is from Maryland? The chance is 8 out of 12 possible results because there are 12 names. Multiplied by the second event. What is the probability that you will still get a Marylander on the second pick? Is it 8 over 12? The answer is no more. Because notice that in the first event, you already selected one person from Maryland. So the second event now is affected by the fact that the first event already happened. So the probability now here would be 7 because 1 was already picked. And the total is no longer 12. Instead, it's 11 because one person was already removed from the list. We now say that this second event is dependent on the first event. And let's compute this one. So 8 over 12 times 7 over 11 is equal to 8 times 7, 56. 12 times 11 is 132. And then let's convert that to decimal. This is equal to 0 0.424 or 42.4%. So that is now what we mean by this multiplication rule for dependent events. The probability of A and B when they are dependent is the probability of A, which is this 8 over 12, times the probability of B given A. So the probability of the second event, knowing that we already selected 1 in the first event, is now 7 over 11. So this 7 over 11 now is the equivalent of this P of B given A. So that's the meaning of this multiplication rule for dependent events. Now let's proceed to the last rule that we are going to discuss in this lesson. We call this as the conditional probability rule. The conditional probability rule looks like this. The probability of B happening knowing that A already happened is the product of both of them happening divided by the probability of A. Now notice that this formula can just be derived from the multiplication rule for dependent events because given this formula given that formula if I divide both sides by the probability of A this will cancel out so you'll have probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A and notice this form is just this conditional probability form. So probability of B given A is this. Probability of A and B is this. And over probability of A, which is this. So this conditional probability rule is just a variation of the multiplication rule for dependent events. So let's see some of its application. Let's say we have this situation. I draw one card and look at it. I tell you it is red. What is the probability that it is a heart? So this problem can be translated as the probability of getting a heart given that it is red. 
situation can now be translated as the probability of both of them, red and heart, divided by the probability of A. And our A is this one, the second one. Probability of red. And what is the probability of red and heart? In a standard deck of cards, how many of these cards are both red and heart? So there are 13 out of 52 cards that are hearts of red. And then how many cards of these 52 cards are color red? There are 26 out of 52 cards that are red. And then solving for this, we got 13 over 52 times the reciprocal 52 over 26. We'll be able to cancel out 52 and we got 13 divided by 26 which is 1 half. So in this situation, I draw one card and look at it knowing that it is red then your chance of getting a heart is one half because there are only two possibilities there either you get a heart or a diamond so you have 50 50 percent chance of getting red heart so that is one application of this conditional probability rule